So, you know, oftentimes people will hold up the Bible and say, the Bible is clear, or the Bible says this. And people um, who do that are not always thinking about where the Bible comes from. I think on some level they do know that it comes from manuscripts. Um, and they probably know that there are thousands of manuscripts. Um, but what they might not know is not every single manuscript was exactly alike. And finding the ones that are closer to the source, oftentimes those are the oldest manuscripts, even the best manuscripts. And in fact, several text critics have pointed out that the further back you go, the more variation you get, which is not what you would expect if there was this word of God that was carefully preserved. You would expect that like, oh, down the line, some people snuck some things in. But if you go to the very beginnings, you see a lot of textual variation. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where we try to increase the public's access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and confront the spread of misinformation about the same. I am very excited today to have Dr. Elizabeth schrader Pulzer with us. How are you doing today, Elizabeth? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day here. Good to hear. And where are you located at the moment? I am in Durham, North Carolina for the next few weeks, and then I'll be moving to Philadelphia shortly. All right. Well, that's uh, that's. I'm trying to think about the the difference in weather there. Um, fewer mountains, probably, but uh, yeah, it's a little more or, humid here. But we got yeah. both beach and mountain. Like three hours west is mountains, three hours east is beach. So yeah, all good. Okay. Well, we are um, very excited to be talking to you. Well, I am very excited to be talking to you today. That's uh, longtime viewers. The whole what two months that we've been around will recognize <laughs> that we are one Dan short. Uh, and Dan alas. Beecher, alas, indeed, is uh, unfortunately uh, down with a touch of the COVID, down with the sickness, as the great oh, poet once no. said. Um, and so he's not feeling uh, up to, uh, he's not, uh, let's say, what's the one? <laughs> I used to say this to my, my 14-year-old all the, all the time, uh, and now I've forgotten the words that I use. Something about being on camera, I always get a little... <laughs> a, a little glitchy, but he's not, uh, he's not dressed to receive. Let's just put it oh, that alas. way. Alas. Well, um, send him my regards. I was looking forward to chatting with him, but some other time, perhaps. Definitely. Some other time. Now, right before we got started here, uh, you mentioned that you are, this is your second career. And I want to get yes. started into talking about Mary with the fact that you wrote a song about Mary as a singer songwriter as your uh, part of your previous career. And did that actually play a direct role in your becoming interested in academically studying Mary Magdalene? It, it was, I, I always describe it as like a wormhole to another life. I had been doing <laughs> the music business for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a band and we toured with people like Jewel and Poe, and we opened for like Rusted Root. We did a lot of fun oh, things, wow. <laughs> and um, and I was on an episode of the Gilmore Girls. There was like I did <laughs> I did a lot of stuff in the music uh -huh. business, um, and I kind of found that over time there were diminishing returns in the music mm. business, which because it's a very if anybody's noticed it's a very youth oriented culture, and yeah. um, and so sort of as time went on and I gained more and more experience, it was like less and less. Uh, successful, which to me okay. was very irksome because I knew I was getting better and better at my craft. Interesting. And so at a certain point, I was just feeling very frustrated. And it was around that time that I was, um, I've always been a very spiritual person. I know, I know not everybody on this podcast is a spiritual person, <laughs> but I have always been a spiritual person. And I was mm -hmm. in a garden dedicated to the Virgin Mary and I was sort of praying and I actually heard words in response to my prayer and they were, maybe you should talk to Mary Magdalene about that. And I was like, <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's not what I was expecting. And also I don't like hear words in responses to prayers usually. So I thought that was very strange. And so I walked, I marched right over to the Brooklyn Public Library. I was living in Brooklyn, New York at this time. And I checked out the complete idiot's guide to Mary Magdalene. Okay, and that's a good start. Yeah, well, I mean, it was actually, it was a great, it was a great introduction. And then I just started becoming interested in Mary Magdalene. Um, but also, I after, as I left the garden, I had this sort of lyric in my head that said that was, 
I went to the Garden of the Holy Virgin and I asked for the blessing of the Magdalene. And I and I was like, oh, that's kind of cute. That's a cute lyric. So I went home and I kind of wrote this song much more quickly than usual. It only took me a couple <laughs> of days to write the song uh-huh. and I recorded it. And so then it was, um, I released a record called Magdalene. And that just caused me to say, oh, you know, I can't release a record about Mary Magdalene without knowing something about her. Mm-hmm. Little did I know that I was stumbling upon what is, in fact, the world's deepest rabbit hole. And now <laughs> I am a Mary Magdalene scholar, and it is yeah. now my profession. And um, I am now like a professor of New Testament, which is very weird because I remember <laughs> very clearly that I was a singer-songwriter in Brooklyn not so long yeah. ago. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, quite a different life. But I'm, I hopefully that that colors your research and the contributions that you can make, make to research in, in a helpful way. There are a lot of once you get to know a lot of biblical scholars, it's it's interesting how many other hobbies and other lives there are out there that we don't see on the on the pages of the articles and the books that we read. Yeah, um, everybody's got a reason for getting into it. Um, sometimes they'll tell <laughs> yeah. you, and sometimes they won't. Um, but mine is very public. You can go watch the Magdalene video, and it it was yeah, released I'll, before I ever started graduate work, so it's easy to find. Well, I'll, I'll definitely have to do that. And um, yeah, rusted root. That's a that's a pretty distinct sound. When I've got Pandora going, I can tell if a rusted root uh, song has has come on. But, yeah, um, they were great. Um, it was at the Warfield in San Francisco. We got we did yeah. some fun stuff when I was in that yeah. band. I bet. I and I seem to recall music kind of changing a little bit. Was this around like twenty years ago? Early um, early two thousands. Yeah, around. That's then. kind of when for me music shifted a little bit. I th- I think it got more. It got slicker. The production cha- yeah. took over a lot of the. That's the true. Music, so. That's true. Got a more digital. Yeah, it did. Well, I don't want to get um, too bogged down in the in the weeds of uh, of your backstory, but thank you for sharing that with me. I, I sure. did not come across that in the research that uh, that's uh, good. That, I read in that means that my scholarship for. is standing on its own. Um, yes, I think so, so that I'm I'm glad to hear that. Good. Well I wanted to to get started talking um starting with about a forty thousand foot view and kind of zooming in on sure. on Mary Magdalene, but you you published in the um was it uh, HTR? Yes. Yeah, Harvard Theological Review um, research about uh, Martha of Bethany and her relationship to Mary. But I want to talk a little bit about textual criticism because this sure. is a question of textual criticism. And something that I run across an awful lot on social media is that a lot of people don't realize just how much their New Testament, their translation of the New Testament relies on scholars making judgment mm-hmm. calls about text critical questions in cobbling yeah. together the source text that we use uh, for the New Testament. In fact, uh, a lot of people, if they hear me say, and we have an eclectic source text, they don't yes. even know what that means. Yes. Um, wh- a lot of your work has to do directly with textual criticism. Maybe you can talk a little bit about why it, it would be helpful for readers of the Bible to understand more about what goes into the production of their Bible. Sure. Speaking yeah. about textual criticism specifically. So, you know, oftentimes people will hold up the Bible and say, the Bible is clear, or the Bible says this. And people um, who do that are not always thinking about where the Bible comes from. I think on some level, they do know that it comes from manuscripts. Um, and they probably know that there are thousands of manuscripts. Um, but what they might not know is how the, like they, they probably also suspect that because everything was copied by hand before the advent of the printing press, not every single manuscript was exactly alike. But maybe that's where they stop thinking about it. And they're like, somebody has already figured this out. And this version in front of me, hopefully not the King James, but maybe it is the King James. <laughs> they're like, this this is, you know, the word of God. Um, and what textual criticism is important because it's basically looking at as many manuscripts as possible and finding the ones that are closer to the source. Oftentimes those are the oldest manuscripts. um, And oftentimes those manuscripts are in Greek uh, if we're talking about the New Testament, Mm -hmm. because the New Testament was written in Greek. I'm a New Testament textual criticism. Of course, Hebrew manuscripts would be, sorry, Old Testament would be in Hebrew. Yeah. Um, so for a New Testament scholarship, um, they find sort of what they consider to be the best manuscripts. And then when you're looking at the different manuscripts, sometimes they don't all say the same thing. 
even the best manuscripts. And in fact, (laughs) several text critics have pointed out that the further back you go, the more variation you get, which is not what you would expect if there was this word of God that was carefully preserved. You would expect that like, oh, down the line, some people snuck some things in. And that happened too. But if you go to the very beginnings, you see a lot of textual variation. Um, And so it's the job of modern scholars. People don't think about this. It's literally the job of scholars that uh, often in Germany, (laughs) a committee of excellent European text critics who compare all of these different versions and they sort of adjudicate between them and say, well, you know what? I think that this manuscript has the correct reading. And it's almost like a legal case has to be Mm -hmm. made for each variant because somebody could say, oh, well, the reason that the variant is this way, the reason that we're getting variation is because we know that there was this early Christian controversy. I'll give you a simple one. So in some manuscripts of Luke's gospel, when Jesus is in the temple and, um, you know, Mary and Joseph go and look for Jesus because he's, you know, he stayed behind and like, they're like, oh, where did he go? Um, I think it's in Luke too. So they go back and some manuscripts, so some manuscripts say, when his parents went back to look for him, dot, dot, dot. Some other manuscripts say, when his mother and Joseph went back to look for him, right? Yeah. And so what's going on there? There's textual variation. And at first you might just be like, why? Why is there textual variation? But for people who understand what's going on in early Christianity, they know that um, it would have been controversial to say that Joseph fathered Jesus, yeah. right? Mary was supposed to be a virgin at the time of conception. So to say his parents is a controversial reading. And you can see then why a scribe might want, or an editor might want to change the text to say his mother and Joseph. Is it, is it Luke where we have the genealogy that talks about Joseph as who is supposed to have been his father or who was, is that the the Luke genealogy? That's, you know, that's either Luke or Matthew. (laughs) One of them says that it's, yeah, one of them says that it's um, supposedly his father. Yeah. But, um, But basically, in Luke, it says the different manuscripts say different things. Sometimes mm-hmm. it says that Mary and his, sorry, his mother and Joseph, and sometimes it says his parents. And so the question that a text critic then has is you have to sort of make a legal argument. Which one of these mm-hmm. is the right one? And you say, you know what? I think the one that says his parents is what Luke actually wrote because it's the more difficult reading. Yeah, that's the one that somebody would change. And that's so that's how a lot of text critical judgments are made based on what the more difficult reading is. But somebody might argue it a different way, you know, and so you can make different legal arguments, not legal, but like text critical arguments. Right. And then you land on one and that's what gets printed in your Bible. And I think a lot of people who have some familiarity with textual criticism might hear about Lectio Difficilior. The more difficult yes, reading the is usually reading the, is or lectio brevior. The shorter reading is usually, and and think, oh, that's a that's a hard and fast rule. That means that is de- determinative about this given reading. But there are more there are more uh, probabilities and likelihoods, and so yeah. sometimes you have to weigh one against another. That's right. Say, um, sometimes the shorter reading is, um, or certainly the longer reading is the more difficult reading. Yeah. So so. Basically, it's always a balance of probabilities. It's often mm-hmm. said that textual criticism is an art, not a science. And so what <laughs> that's sort of cloaked from you when you're mm-hmm. in when you're looking at your Bible, yeah. because um, it looks like the text is clear, but in fact, um, dozens, if not hundreds of readings have been adjudicated. And sometimes different scholars might come to different conclusions. And that's yeah. actually reflected in different translations. Mm-hmm. Um, because sometimes a different translation will choose a different Greek variant. People say, oh, it's been mistranslated. I'm not talking about the translation. I'm talking about the underlying Greek text. Yeah. There's different Greek manuscripts that say different things. And different uh, committees might choose one over the other for different reasons. I know one that one that comes up a lot in the scholarship that I work with is John 118, which is a, uh, a variant that... Um, Comes is that the down only begotten to, son of right, God? right. The yeah. so it's uh, it's either the only only son right. or the only God, and you, oh, the earlier yes, yes. and so you have this. There's a the earlier reading, I believe, is uh, is 
son. And this matches what you have every other time this phrase occurs in John. However, you have some very early readings that also say God. And so the, um, the question then becomes, a lot of people leverage this Lectio uh, Difficilior. This is, right. it would be, it's more likely the change would go from God to son than it would go from son to God in, in this argument. And so I think even uh, within Metzger's New Testament textual commentary, he says that he kind of advocates for the God reading, but then the editor is like, uh, has a little spot at the bottom saying, not really, probably not what the, the author originally wrote. Well, right. Yeah. And so people, what, I guess what I highlighted in um, what I just, I just defended my dissertation. And one of the things that I highlight is that text critics have differing judgments. Like they, like one yeah. text critic might come to this conclusion and another one, one might come to that conclusion. Yeah. And that's a place where literally what the author wrote, we don't know. Yeah. We can't be certain what the author wrote. You can only argue with differing levels of persuasion for yeah. one variant over the other. And um, there's dozens, if not hundreds of places like that in the New Testament. And that is kind of masked from the average reader. Um, study Bibles are clearer about it because it'll say at the bottom of your study Bible, it'll say like, oh, some ancient authorities read this other thing or some ancient authorities lack this. And they're really talking about some ancient manuscripts say something yeah. different. Yeah, and that's when we have uh, textual attestation to a reading. However, there are some reconstructions that are hypothesized rather than or conjectural, according to the uh, to the parlance of our times. Yes, uh, where we th something is fishy, and we think we have an idea what it probably originally looked like, but we don't have any manuscript that uh, definitively points to that reading, and that's. Uh, more closely related to the research that you published in Harvard Theological Review with uh, Martha of Bethany, uh, to some degree. I know there are, there are variations in the manuscripts, but I think you're advocating for a conjectural emendation to some degree, correct? Um, that's an interesting thought. I mean, part <laughs> of my reconstruction is an eclectic text. You were talking earlier about eclectic texts, which is when you take there's no one manuscript that says exactly what you provide, the Greek right. text that you provide. And it, this is the same thing for a critical edition. A Greek critical edition is when a committee of scholars gets together and they look at all the best manuscripts and they put all the best readings together, like they kind of cobble them together. And there's no one manuscript that reads exactly this, mm -hmm. but it's their best guess for what the author wrote based on their arguments, right? So I've actually, I have actually constructed an eclectic text with real readings from real manuscripts of John 11, one through five, okay. um, that is just Lazarus and Mary. So it, we're talking about John 11 here. This is the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. And um, in the world's oldest copy of John 11, which is Papyrus 66, which is usually dated to the turn of the third century, though it's paleographically dated, so we can't be certain, but it's, it is probably our oldest copy of so John So somewhere 11. around... 200 CE. Yes. Okay. Um, you can see in that manuscript that the name Mary has been crossed out twice. Um, first, the name Mary is changed to Martha in John 11, verse 1. And in John 11, verse 3, a woman's name is awkwardly scratched out and changed to say, Hi Adelphi, the sisters. And all the verbs are changed from singular to plural. So a woman mm -hmm. is actually split in two by the scribe. Um, and then there's another change in John 11, 4 and Papyrus 66 that sort of cloaks that Jesus could be speaking with one woman. Um, and so there's a lot of instability around Martha's presence at the opening of John 11 in Papyrus 66. If you look at Codex Alexandrinus, which is another really important gospel manuscript, again, you see the name Mary getting changed to Martha. And you see in John 11, verse 1, Martha wasn't there in the first transcription. And then there's another old Latin manuscript that... Um, in John 11, 5, only Lazarus and his sister, singular, are listed. Mm -hmm. So if you cobble all these together, you get a different text form of John 11 that introduces Lazarus and his one sister, Mary. Yeah. And so and this, then, was, yeah. this was influencing manuscripts as late as the 4th slash 5th century. Oh, so, I mean, no, you, you actually get it throughout the entire textual transmission. One in really? five Greek manuscripts has a problem around Martha. So I've, I've looked at about 280 manuscripts of the Gospel of John now, mm -hmm. and you get it in every language. Um, I just looked at some Ge'ez manuscripts the other week, uh, which is Ethiopic, 
right. you see that um, even some 14th century manuscripts, the names right. Mary and Martha are switched or the name Mary appears where you would expect only, uh, well, either Mary and Martha or just uh, Martha. So you see that there's textual instability. It happens in um, Greek, in Latin, in Syriac, in Coptic, in oh. Ge'ez. And so um, the fact that it's happening throughout the entire textual transmission is a clue that something might have been changed here. Well, and it sounds like if it's not been standardized, if it's not been smoothed out over that long a period of time, there must have been some kind of disagreement. There must have been, there was some reason for that to keep coming up. There was some reason for that yes. question to not go away. Have you, have you talked about that? Well, yeah. I mean, it's. Um, I'm basically saying that it's possible that a character, the character I'm talking about is Luke. Sorry, not Luke. It's Martha from Luke's gospel. So in Luke chapter mm -hmm. 10, there's these two sisters, Martha and Mary, that Jesus visits. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have a brother in that story, which is really interesting. And everybody knows this story. Martha's just busy and distracted. Mary's sitting at Jesus's feet. Martha complains about Mary and Jesus says, um, Martha, Martha, you were worried and distracted with many things, but Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken from her. So mm. um, I'm saying that someone who had read that story in Luke's gospel might have sort of imported the character Martha and stuck her into this story of Lazarus and Mary in John's gospel. And I'm saying that it's possible that as Luke wrote his gospel, there was just Martha and Mary, no brother. And as John wrote his gospel, it's just Lazarus and Mary, one sister. And so it's only because someone had read Conflated Luke. Conflated these Marys. Yeah, it, exactly. And they stuck Martha in. But that's that's actually a huge change to the text. You're adding a yeah. character over the course of an entire chapter. And so I'm saying that that kind of a massive change to the text is going to have echoes and reverberations throughout the entire textual transmission, which in fact it does. Also the artistic yeah. record and the patristic record, when you see church fathers talking about it, like Tertullian says, oh, when Mary confessed Jesus is the Christ, you're like, what? Martha confesses Jesus is the Christ. But Tertullian, who wrote in about 208 AD, he says that Mary confessed Jesus is the Christ. You see the sort of uneven presentation of Martha and Mary mm -hmm. literally in every place that you look to do with the Lazarus story in antiquity. So that, and it sounds like this is a product of trying to harmonize these two different gospels and trying to take what yes. are ultimately two anonymous, not anonymous, but but we don't know precisely who they are, but they seem to be separate characters and try to to mash them together to make things fit. And, and this would fit what we know about a lot of the changes that have only recently been kind of removed from a lot of uh, more recent translations of the Bible. There are little over a dozen passages that are found in the the Textus Receptus, the mm. uh, the much later manuscript tradition that now many translations just omit altogether, which is causing yes. all kinds of heartache on social oh, media yeah. when people stumble across this. Like but, the um, angel at the pool. The angel in, at the pool. In the, John 5. Um, or else uh, there's also the pericope of the adulteress. Yeah. Um, there's the 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 sweat, the bloody sweat in Luke twenty. So actually, that one's in that one's in uh, brackets usually. Yeah. Um, the yeah. endings of Mark. Yeah, there are a bunch of examples of these. The one that I that I always see on social media that somebody stumbles across and thinks they've discovered either CERN has has altered reality and we're in a parallel universe where uh, Matthew. What is it? Seventeen twenty doesn't exist, uh, or or somebody oh. is uh, doing something to the Bibles. But that's an instance where we have a, a passage from Mark where Luke is talking, or not Luke, Jesus is talking about uh, why the disciples weren't able to cast out certain demons, and and he says this this kind doesn't come out except with fasting and prayer, and that gets mm -hmm. written into the the margin of Sinaiticus, I think, and then later manuscripts, it's it's incorporated right into the verse, and so so yeah, this kind of glosses like somebody somebody because mm -hmm. it's all copied by hand at this time. It's it's such a different mindset. It's it's very foreign to people who live in a print culture. Like this text says this, but yeah. if you're copying something by hand. What if somebody's reading it and they put a little note in the margin and then some later person sees it and they don't, they're not familiar with the text and they're like, oh, was something left out? Oh, yeah. I should put this what in. And it's here? called a gloss. And yeah. so then you get this extra piece of the story that gets incorporated into the broader manuscript transmission. Yeah. And so then sometimes the text sort of expands. But then if you go to these older copies, 
copies like Papyrus 66 or Codex Sinaiticus or Vaticanus, these parts are just not there because they haven't been added to the text yet. It's only yeah. the second, third, fourth century. They haven't added that part yet. <laughs> and John has a handful of literary seams where it seems like there's something going on for which we may not really have much evidence. For instance, there's uh, during the Last Supper, Jesus is like, all right, everybody, let's let's get up and get out of here. And then you have three chapters of sermonizing. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the next chapter goes, so they got up and got out of there. Um, and, and it comes like it two chapters little, uh, later. Yeah. Well, and then there's another, he's in Jerusalem and it's like, they crossed over to the other side of the sea of Galilee. And yes. it's like, how did they do that? And, yeah. Yeah. And that one's interesting. Cause that's more about source criticism because people who are studying John, they say, this doesn't make sense. Like was whoever wrote this gospel, did they get their pages mixed up? Did they like lose a folio or did like, did somebody mix <laughs> something up? But that's not a text critical issue. Because yeah. every single manuscript of John, um, he does go straight to the Sea of Galilee and he does say, um, you know, let's go. And then he talks for two more chapters. So yeah. that one is more source criticism. It's more like, hey, we're intelligent people. We can see the story doesn't make sense here. Something happened here in whoever was creating the narrative. That's different Mm -hmm. than when the different manuscripts say different things. Right, right. And what's funny is that source critics actually already theorized that Martha was added to the text. This is really funny. John P. Meyer in um, A Marginal Jew, he says mm -hmm. the first story of the, of Lazarus, he only had, only Mary was there. And he didn't know anything about the these manuscript variations that I'm talking about. The reason he said that is because Martha and Mary say a duplicate quote. In John 11, mm. they yeah. say, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And so for a source critic, that's a clue that something was doubled. But John P. Meyer would have thought that it was the evangelist that doubled the sister. There's other people like uh, Robert Fortna and Urban Von Waldy that, that work on these sorts of source critical questions in John. And they're mm -hmm. like, the evangelist had a source that they changed. I'm saying, was it the evangelist? Or was it a later copyist? And the the way that you can tell whether the evangelist inherited a story that was that the evangelist changed versus whether someone interfered in the textual transmission mm -hmm. is whether there are discrepancies in the manuscripts. There's no discrepancies on when Jesus says, come on, let's go. And then he keeps talking. That happens in every manuscript. But this thing with one or two sisters being there, there are problems around Mary and Martha in the yeah. textual transmission, which suggests that it's not what the evangelist wanted. It's what a later copyist wanted. And we've we've also got a bit of a black hole between the composition of these texts and our I always call it a black hole. I call yeah. it I call it a, a gap or a black hole and and um that's but what, yeah, that's that's, or I call it a black box. I call it a, a black, black box. box. Okay. Yeah, that's um I uh Peter Gurry and I got into it on Twitter. Uh, the other I day. saw that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I yeah. stayed out of it because P Peter and I have very, very different views uh, yeah. on religion and doctrine. But he's a good text critic, and I, I, uh, I don't recommend getting into Twitter fights with Peter Gurry about textual criticism because <laughs> he does know his stuff. But I think yeah. he and I have a healthy mutual respect. Um, we we come to different conclusions mm -hmm. um, about the data, but we both are well aware of what the evidence is. Yeah. He's uh I I appreciated that he didn't get too upset cuz sometimes uh people can get upset uh on <laughs> when we get into it on social media but I'm sure he's used to these kinds of disagreements with folks. He um, is. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to uh to pivot uh, a little bit and talk a little bit more about Mary Magdalene's origins cuz we Talked a little bit about John 11 and but how- But we should also talk about why it has to do with Mary Magdalene, because everybody's like, what? You're talking about Mary of Bethany, y'all. Like, oh, that's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, not, that's I just, not I just Mary skipped Magdalene. over that, didn't I? Okay, so- <laughs> We should probably talk about it. <laughs> so for, uh, for the whole discussion that I skipped over, what is the relationship between Martha slash Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene? Well, so- um, the the natural question, if if I've made this argument, okay, somebody read Luke's gospel, they imported the character Martha from Luke 10, stuck her into John 11. Why would somebody do that? Like other than just that we're harmonizing and we're somebody named Mary and we're just trying to like have fun and be creative with our gospel stories. Why would somebody do that? And so um, what I theorized, and of course, um, this is just one possibility for why there's problems around Martha in the textual transmission. 
I said, well, we know that very early Christians going back as the third or possibly even the second century thought that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene. We, um, we have that on record from Hippolytus of Rome who is a mm-hmm. third century commentator from the Manichaean Psalm book. And the Manichaeans were again in like the third century and also from St. Ambrose, who's fourth century. All of these people identify Mary Magdalene as Mary of Bethany. Um, so that's, that's interesting. Why did people think that Mary Magdalene was Mary of Bethany? It might even go back to the second century because the gospel of Mary, um, the character Mary in this, it doesn't say Magdalene anywhere or Bethany anywhere in that text, um, at least in the surviving text. But it does, uh, there are character traits of both Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene that are found in this character, Mary, of the Gospel Mm -hmm. of Mary. So some people have said, you know, maybe as far back as the second century, people identified Mary of Bethany with Mary Magdalene. And so I'm saying, why would you add Martha to the Lazarus story? And so one possibility that I put out there is, well, what if the text was what Tertullian said, that Mary confessed Jesus as the Christ. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. That happens to be the central thesis statement of the Gospel of John. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's called the Christological Confession. And in every single gospel except John, it is on somebody else's lips. That person is Peter. Yep. Peter gets to be the Christological confessor in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Matthew's gospel, that gives him... Uh, sort of the title, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Mm. So because Peter is the Christological confessor, it gives him this huge authority. And so I'm suggesting, okay, well, what if John, most people think John had access to some version of Mark's gospel. What if John had read Mark and knew that Peter was, was being identified as the Christological confessor, and John wanted to give a different narrative. And John wanted to give it to Mary Magdalene, that Mary Magdalene is the Christological confessor, but perhaps knowing that this was controversial um, because Mary Magdalene does seem to have a lot of controversy around her again, as far back as we can trace the record. So John just calls her Mary and makes her extremely similar to Mary Magdalene. There's something like seven or eight exact textual parallels between John 11 and John 20. There's a woman named Mary. She's crying at a tomb. She sees somebody that she loves dearly rise from the dead. Jesus says to her in John 11, where have you laid him? And then in John 20, Mary says, I do not know where you have laid him. It's sort of like this exact same in Greek, the words are the same, where Jesus asks Mary something in John 11, Mary asks Jesus something when she thinks he's the gardener, Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20. And of course, um, Mary of Bethany uh, anoints Jesus in John 12, and Judas gets mad, and Jesus says, um, you know, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing. Um, Let her save it for the day of my burial. And there's only one Mary at his tomb in John, and that is Mary Magdalene. So there's a lot of suggestions. I'm not saying that the author of John identifies Lazarus's sister Mary as Mary Magdalene. But I absolutely think that the author of John has put the question in the reader's mind, Mm -hmm. is Mary of Bethany Mary Magdalene? And on two or three reads of the gospel, you might notice how very similar Lazarus's sister Mary is with Mary Magdalene. And that may be why people as far back as perhaps the gospel of Mary, but definitely Hippolytus of Rome, the Manichaeans and Ambrose, third, fourth centuries, think that Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene. But then if she's the one who confesses Jesus as the Christ, that means that the person who gets the central Christological confession also gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus. That's a problem (laughs) because it gives her a lot of authority. It means that she confesses him as the Christ, anoints him, stands by him at the cross, goes alone to the tomb, gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus, and gets the first apostolic commission. And that would just make her a central character. Yeah. And an authority figure in early Christianity that might have been just a bit too much for this gospel. Do you, think, do you think the author of John was kind of censoring himself a little bit and just trying to kind of put it out there without, you know, I didn't actually say that, but... Um, I think John was trying to make it, make the information accessible to the sensitive reader. That's that's something that John does a lot, in fact. Mm-hmm. That's something that John is well known for. People often say, oh, John is a, is a gospel that a child can 
can uh, pl- can wade in or an elephant can swim in because it has all these levels of meaning. Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, it's you can just clearly identify, and in my Harvard Theological Re- Review article I do, these are the exact textual parallels between John 11 and John 20. And, and so because of those parallels, some people, it, it's not going to be forced upon you. But if you want to think that Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene, you're invited to think so. And yeah. maybe it's said delicately, knowing that if the Christological confessor is explicitly identified as Mary Magdalene, that this gospel is not going to be received. That that might have been a problematic. And in fact, the gospel of Mary was not at all received. Nobody even talks yeah. about it. So if you put Mary as too prominent of a character, it's not something that I, this is, of course, theoretical. This is yeah. this is like if there is a copy of John circulating with only Lazarus and Mary, why would somebody add Martha? I'm saying, well, maybe because people thought it was Mary Magdalene, and that was too much. So they were trying to shore it up a little bit more than than the author originally did. I, Just a remi- theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a good theory, a good hypothesis, and and hopefully there are uh, future manus- manuscript discoveries that that can help us uh, find some more data that that might help us uh, test that hypothesis. Um, just to remind me, in when Mary comes to the tomb, is she coming to prepare the body? Does she have that? Actually, stuff? no. That's that's a it's a very important point that you raised there because the body has already been prepared in John right. nineteen with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. In okay. the Synoptics, it is Mary, um, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary. If it's Matthew, or actually, different manuscripts say different things in Mark, <laughs> um, and and in Luke. Anyway, Mary Magdalene is always at the tomb. But again, John is writing for people who have read Mark. This is something yeah. that is well accepted in scholarship. Some people think Mm -hmm. that John was sort of supplementing Mark, maybe even Matthew. So John is writing for people who know that Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. And we have in, um, at the end of John, we have Jesus's feed my sheep um, Uh, to to Peter. So it's not going so far as to supplant uh, Peter's role in the church, is it? Well, that's another long question that we could get into because source <laughs> critics source critics think that John 21 was added later yeah. because John 20 verse 31 seems to draw the gospel to a close. These things are written so that you will believe that Jesus yeah. is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, which is kind of the same thing that today Martha says in John 11. Um, but And then it goes on. It's like, oh, and then Jesus appeared again. So people wonder if John 21 was added later. Well, we have in John 21 also the, the statement, um, these are the words of the, the disciple who loved him, and we know that they are true. Yes. So somebody, there's definitely a later literary layer there, and yeah. maybe the yeah. question is, how how far into John does, does this we stretch? Um, yeah, and again, that's the question of, you know, was it the evangelist that wrote that? Was it a later member of the Johannine community? If you believe in the Johannine community, did they do that? Is it something that was written in the second century and we just don't have any manuscripts that old? Um, so it's hard to know. But also John 21 is even a little bit cagey about Peter's authority if you mm. look at the Greek because what Jesus asks Peter to do, Peter is unable to do. Jesus says, do you agapes me? Do you love me? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I follow you. So the verb actually changes. So Jesus asks Peter to um, agapao, which is one right, verb right. for love. And Peter always responds with a different verb. Yes, I follow you. And then Jesus yeah. asks again, agapes. Peter says, yes, I follow you. The third time Jesus changes his position. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, do you phileis me? Do you, it's a different word for love. Right. And then Peter's hurt. Now, everybody thinks that Peter's hurt because Jesus is asking three times. But it is absolutely possible that Peter is hurt because the verb changed. Even though, even though he's the one who's kind of pulling it back a little bit, that there's something similar in Spanish. Uh, I you hear jokes every now and then where somebody will say "te amo" and the other person says "te quiero," which oh, is which is a very it's a related verb, but it's not as strong. And so yes, that very... is a, you know that's the best analogy that I've heard. I love that. That's and and the thing is, it's totally masked in your English translation because just love, love, love. Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love right, me? Right. Yes, I love you. It sounds like Peter has proven himself. But if you look at the Greek, Peter hasn't proven himself. The thing mm-hmm. that Jesus asked him to do, he cannot do. So Jesus actually changes to meet Peter where he is at. 
He says, do you filace me? And Peter says, you know everything. I follow you. That's all that Peter can do. He can yeah. only phileo Jesus. He cannot agapao Jesus. So that's, but then some people say, oh, they're cognates. They mean exactly the same thing. And that's another scholarly debate. But yeah. you could argue <laughs> that Peter is not 100% reconciled, even in John 21. Okay. Well, that hopefully brings us back around to a little bit more about Mary and her origins. Um, I'm leaving uh, on tomorrow uh, to go to Israel. Uh, one of the, uh, so I'm, jealous. I'm going to be uh, leading a tour, and uh, one of the places we're going to be stopping is Magdala, yes, uh, to Magdala. which I have been before, a lovely area, phenomenal um, uh, buildings that we have there, and, and particularly the synagogue yes. with the, the altar with the temple imagery on there. I'm looking forward to that. But uh, th it's Magdala is always introduced as Mary Magdalene's hometown. But if Mary is of Bethany, then can Mary also be of Magdala? What a fantastic question. Well, first of all, um, I did co-write another article, which you kindly highlighted on your uh, platform with Joan Taylor in mm -hmm. 2021 in the Journal of Biblical Literature, where we basically pointed out that not a single person ever said that Mary Magdalene came from that place where you're going to visit until the sixth century. The sixth century is the earliest attesta attestation of anyone saying that Mary Magdalene came from that place by the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. And um, we also, Joan Taylor is more, she understands the archaeological stuff more than I do. But basically that site, which is beautiful, incredible archaeological site with absolutely first century synagogues, very important ar archaeological site, that was more likely the town of Terrake, which was known at that time. It was discussed by Pliny um, and Josephus. It was, it was well known. It was a big city on the Sea of Galilee. And no one ever said that that place is where, Mag where Mary Magdalene is from. No one ever said that until the sixth century. Um, rather, there were lots of towns at that time called Migdal this, Migdal, there was Migdal Gad, Migdal Eater, Migdal mm -hmm. L. It just means tower, tower of this, tower of that, right? Yeah. And so, um, there because there were towers all over ancient Palestine and there were and there was eventually, I think it's in later rabbinic sources, there's a place called Migdal Nunaya, which means Tower of the Fishes, that was close to Terake. But um later uh I it, really it it gained momentum sort of in the 19th and 20th centuries to say that um Migdal Nunaya was Mary Magdalene's hometown. Um and there was various reasons for that. But um, so one of them being that um, there was sort of a, a noble desire to separate Mary Magdalene from the sinful anointing woman in Luke chapter seven. So um, basically in the sixth century, Gregory the Great said, following in the lineage of Ambrose and Hippolytus and everybody else, that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene. Gregory said that in the sixth century, but he added an innovation. He said, and she is that woman who, um, who the sinful woman who uh, anointed Jesus in Luke 7. He didn't say Luke 7, but he said, um, you know, surely like all of her sins, like the, the Mary, Mary has seven demons in right. Luke's gospel. He says, what were these seven demons other than the sins of the flesh? And this, this perfumed ointment was like, you know, it, it was used in unspeakable acts. And he's just kind of making it all up. Basically what he's done is he has collapsed all of the anointing events together. And my position, and I want to make this really clear, I'm saying that the Bethany anointing described in John's gospel as taking place by Mary, Mary anointing Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that may well be Mary Magdalene who anointed Jesus in Bethany. That is not the same story as Luke's anointing, which first of all takes place in the North close to a town called Nain. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it's much earlier in Jesus's ministry. It does not inaugurate the passion narrative as it does right. in Matthew, Mark, and John. Matthew, Mark, and John, the anointing takes place in Bethany and it inaugurates the passion. This is in, right before the um, the final week. 
Correct. Yes. Whereas in Luke's, it's it's kind of it's in Luke seven. It's it's early in Jesus's ministry, and it's nowhere near Bethany. And it's just that Jesus is in the house of a, a man named Simon, and that this this woman, that sinner from the city, comes in. Basically, what I'm saying is that, and it's also very clear in Luke's gospel that that is not Mary Magdalene, because in Luke's gospel, it's an anonymous person. Yeah. And Mary Magdalene is clearly identified. In Luke's gospel. So basically what Gregory did is he was collapsing all of the anointing scenes into one, which caused um, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany, who I think that John kind of suggests that they are the same woman and that some commentators already were thinking was the same woman. It collapses her because there is an anointing event associated with Mary of Bethany. He draws the other anointing from Luke into that story, even though it takes place at a totally different time. Has a to- is a totally different location and has a totally different narrative around it. Yeah. So Gregory collapses all these anointings into one. Um, and so that's when Mary Magdalene becomes a prostitute or like a sinful woman from the city starting yeah. in the sixth century. So coming back to why would somebody want to say that Mary Magdalene comes from Magdala or that this is, this is sort of a location that she's from? Um, it has to do with sort of a noble and sometimes feminist scholarship as well, has desired to separate Mary Magdalene from any anointing event. Strategically, if you Mm -hmm. say she's from Magdala, it means that she can't have anything to do with the anointing. She can't be Mary of Bethany. She can't have anointed Jesus because she's from Magdala. But the problem with that position is that there's literally no evidence that she came from that place before the sixth century, first of all. And second of all, um, you don't have to separate Mary Magdalene from the anointing in Bethany to say, to, to sort of redeem her from this yeah. false portrait that Gregory painted. You can just say it, there, there's more, the, Luke's anointing is not the same as the Bethany yeah. anointing. It kind of throws the baby out with the bathwater when you exactly. have, when you have exactly. two that can be identified and then you have an undesirable association that, that gets identified. And so you want to just throw the whole thing. Exactly. Out. And so I, I would say it's partly been strategic on the part Mm -hmm. of, like, for instance, Karen King has a book called The Gospel of Mary of Magdala, which is a misnomer in several ways. First of all, because the Gospel of Mary never says the word Magdalene or Magdala anywhere in it. It just refers to a Mary. Second of all, she, when you say Mary of Magdala, you are interpreting for the reader in your translation. The word Magdalene literally just means tower S. That's all that it means. Magdala in Aramaic means tower. Ene is a Greek ending for a female person. Tower S. That's literally the literal meaning of it. So if you're trying to say that she comes, so the question is, does Mary come from a town called Tower? One of these many towers, Migdal Gad, Migdal Eder, Migdal El, Migdal Nunaya. There's so many of them. Are you saying that she comes from a town called Tower? Or are you saying that Mary herself is the Tower? Kind of how Peter is the rock. Mm-hmm. And um, what our Journal of Biblical Literature article showed, in addition to that place being called Terrake in the first century, is that there was no consensus on the meaning of her name for centuries. There never was. Luke seems to think that it's a nickname. He doesn't s- think it's a place that she's from. The way that Luke refers to her, Maria He Calumene Magdalene, Mary the one called the Magdalene. Called, yeah. That word called is always in reference to people with names or nicknames like Simon called Peter or yeah. Elizabeth called Baron or, or you have uh, Josephus Jesus the one called Christ um Col- well I actually it, I hadn't kind of, checked that in Josephus does he use Kalumenos for Jesus there? um I'm pretty I'm pretty sure in the um yeah I'm, I'm almost positive he does because it and it gets I think that's where it gets mm. um manipulated a little bit where um the the reading of Josephus as we have it now is like and he was more than a human he was the Christ but oh. I think the the other reference where it talks about James the brother of Jesus who is called Christ it's a way to not oh, interesting. um not endorse the name but just oh. mention that it is. That's the name. great. I should look that up in Josephus. I mean, in, in our article, we were just looking at Luke's usage in Luke yeah. and Acts and how he uses the word Calomeno, Calomenos, Calomene. And that happens to be nicknames, basically. So Luke seems to think it's a nickname, not where she's from. Mm-hmm. Eusebius, it's really funny. Eusebius knows a place called Magdala and he doesn't associate her with it at all. And he thinks that the Magdala that everybody knows is in the south. He thinks it's in Judea. 
So that one actually really? completely, yeah. So Eusebius is on a says, we know Magdala. It's this one right here in Judea, Migdal Gad. And it's in the <laughs> South. And that completely yeah. blows this idea out of the water that we know where Mary Magdalene was from. And that just the fact that she's Magdalene means she's from that place by the Sea of Galilee. Eusebius lived in the Holy Land, and the purpose of the Onomasticon was to clarify who was associated with which places and which locations in his day matched what the Bible was. He never once says that Terrake is the same thing as Magdala, which is the same yeah. place Mary Magdalene was from. Not at all. He says that there is a Magdala that he knows, and she is not associated with it. And it's in the South. It's not the one by the Sea of Galilee that you're going to go to. So apologies to the people in Magdala, because I know they <laughs> like their pilgrimage yeah. site. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh and is is wasn't there another site Magadan or something like that? Oh, over, that's interesting actually. So, yeah, um there is a place in Matthew 15 where Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee and he lands in the shores of Magadan. And that's what most Bibles today would say uh, mm -hmm. at Matthew 15:39. But if you go to a King James Bible, it'll say he landed in the shores of Magdala. So someone who's really? reading the King James says, hey, wait a second, there is a place called Magdala by the Sea of Galilee in the first century. It says it right here in my Bible. <laughs> and I would again say, what manuscript does that come <laughs> from? Because King James comes from 11th or 12th century manuscripts. Right. And literally all of the oldest manuscripts of Matthew 15 have the word Magadon there. And it is later in the 5th or 6th century that the reading starts to change. And some manuscripts say Magdala. And Professor Taylor and I theorized that this might have been around the time that um, people started to find a pilgrimage site for Mary Magdalene. So in the West, people thought that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene as Hippolytus of Rome and Gregory the Great. This, this is a Western tradition that Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene. Yeah. In the East... They don't think that Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene, but they still want a pilgrimage site, right? Everybody wants a pilgrimage site to venerate Mary Magdalene. So we suggested that it's possible that this, in the sixth century, when people start to say this is where she came from, that there was a little update in the manuscripts. Like you're copying <laughs> Matthew's gospel and all you have to do is change two letters and Magadon becomes Magdala. And now yeah. you've got your place by the Sea of Galilee where you can have a pilgrimage site for Mary Magdalene. And that's where you're going to go when you're in Israel. It does go and, back to the sixth century. It's very old, yeah. but not first century. And it wouldn't be the first time that the King James Version has uh, has uh, misinterpreted uh, something, a name particularly. And we and there there seem to be uh, a couple other places around the Sea of Galilee where the names don't always line up. Uh, the hmm. the miracle of the the swine, for instance, you have. Uh, I think the manuscripts have three different mm -hmm. versions of, the of that name: Gadarenes and the Gergesenes and the yeah. And then there's another one. one. Get uh, yeah. Gadarenes, there's Beth Gergesenes. Zatha and Beth yeah. Seda, and yeah. different manuscripts say different things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always exciting that uh, if you know a lot of people retreat to the old. If the King James version was good enough for Paul or or good enough for <laughs> Jesus, then. then um, <laughs> That That's funny. <laughs> now, can you is the is the controversy around Mary Magdalene in this early period the reasons why there might have been some some apprehension about her leadership? Does this come down just to simple misogyny? Is it about getting in the way of Peter? Do you have thoughts on on mm -hmm. uh, why Mary Magdalene is a target uh, in the the earlier periods? That's that's a great question. Um, and if, you know, I, you, you could argue that there's controversy around her from the very beginning. Certainly the Gospel of Mary presents her as a controversial character. I'm not saying the Gospel of Mary was written by her. Definitely not. Right. It, it's probably a second century text, but it does show... And there show, it's Peter. Peter is the one who's like... Peter and Andrew. You? Yeah. Peter yeah, and yeah. Andrew are kind of attacking her and Levi defends her, which is interesting. Um, but the fact, the very fact that she, like her... Um, sort of her perspective is presented as controversial and that it makes Peter and Andrew angry. And they say, you know, did he speak with a woman? Did he prefer her to us? You know, um, the, the very fact that she's causing this consternation on the part of these sort of more orthodox disciples, Andrew and Peter, is telling us that from a very early stage, there's something about Mary, in this case, probably Mary Magdalene, um, that is threatening. 
And you don't just see it in the Gospel of Mary, also in the Gospel of Thomas, at the very Mm -hmm. end of the Gospel of Thomas, the very last saying of the Gospel of Thomas, Simon Peter says, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. And then Jesus stands up for her and says that she can stay. But also the Gospel of Philip, um, it says that the disciples are jealous of Mary because Jesus loves her more than them. She's like a soulmate for Jesus in the Gospel of Philip, isn't she? Yes. um, she's. There's actually two words for it in uh, the Coptic. One is koinonos, which is a Greco-Coptic word. It's like a loan word from Greek, which basically means partner. And Paul uses that word sometimes, like my koinonos. But there's also a word, um, hotre, which basically is more likely to mean... um, twin or even consort. What's interesting is that uh, in the Gospel of Philip, both the words koinonos and hotre, are they're both translated as companion as though they were the same word. And I'm like, no, koinonos <laughs> means one thing, hotre means something else. Yeah. So I would say, she, anyway, yes, the Gospel of Philip presents her as some sort of companion or twin or consort to Christ in just this one document, the Gospel of Philip. Right, right. And the, the disciples get really jealous of her in that document. And then there's the Pista Sophia where Mary Magdalene is the star pupil and she answers more questions than anybody else. And at a certain point, Jesus says, sorry, they're, they're dialoguing with Jesus on the Mountain of Olives. And at a certain point, Peter gets mad and he's like, let, let this woman stop talking because she's taking all the opportunities away from us. And again, Jesus says, no, if she gets the right, you know, anybody who gets the right answer can come forward. And then Peter says, I'm sorry. Then Mary Magdalene says, Lord, I am scared of Peter because he hates our race probably our race of women or possibly yeah. like our spiritual race, depending upon how you interpret it. But um, these are four different documents. The Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip are in the same codex, but the Gospel of Mary and the Pista Sophia are in totally different codices, copied in totally different places in different centuries. The fact that you have this independent attestation of Peter's hostility toward Mary in several documents over the course of many centuries, suggests that it was kind of widely known. Hmm. There was something that was widely known that Mary, whether because she was close to Peter, whether because she was a woman, whether because she talked too much, Peter did not like her. Hmm. And um, these, you know, Gospel of Mary is probably second century. Gospel of Philip is maybe second century. Pista Sophia is third or fourth century. These are old conversations. And it always irks me when people are like, oh, this feminist agenda of like women's voices. And I'm like, this is second century, second, third century. This is a conversation that's been going on from the very beginning. And Mary seems to represent something controversial. And Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to know exactly what the problem was with her. It could be that she was close to Jesus or smarter than the other ones. And, you know, that made people mad. Maybe Peter gave her the title Mary the Tower, similar to Peter the Rock. Maybe when she confessed him as the Christ, she became Mary the Tower. Um, And that caused jealousy or a desire to like, you know, elbow her out of the way. Peter's like, I'm the one who's the important one, not you. I mean, it's hard to know what exactly the issue was. Some people could say that it it might even go back to the first century because Luke doesn't seem to like Mary Magdalene particularly. Which is odd because Luke kind of stands up for women and he the does. foreigners and others in his in his gospel. It's like it's almost like he presents the Virgin Mary as like be this kind of a woman. <laughs> right? She, yeah. You're like you can talk, but in private, at home with your family members, and you can be very valued and venerated for being obedient and doing what you're supposed to do and for supporting the men like financially as, um, you know, Lydia does and even Mary Magdalene does. Um, Like it's, it's sort of Luke presents women as in a positive light and pays a lot of attention to them, but for doing specific roles. And it's really interesting about Mary Magdalene because he's, most women he does present positively, but he said he's the only one who calls her a demoniac and he's the only one who takes her away from the scene at the cross. Luke knows that Mary Magdalene is at the cross because Luke is basing his narrative on Mark's gospel. Yeah. And he removes the women's name, the women's names from the cross. Wow. And he also removes the women's names from the empty tomb when the, I think, I think it's angels in Luke that show up. And they are not, their names are not revealed until they go and then they tell the male apostles. Once the women tell the men, 
Then Luke says, okay, it was Mary Magdalene and Mary of James and Joanna and some <laughs> others. But he he hesitates. He doesn't identify them at the cross or at the empty tomb like Matthew, Mark, and John do. So he seems to sort of have something about Mary Magdalene that he's he doesn't like. And especially yeah. he doesn't allow her a vision of the risen Jesus. If you read your Gospels and people say, oh, who did Je- the risen Jesus appear to first? People, oh, I know, it's Mary Magdalene. Not if you're reading Luke. Yeah. Mary Magdalene does not get a vision of the risen Jesus in Luke's gospel. Mm-hmm. So Luke seems to maybe be uncomfortable with her. And that's interesting what you said about Josephus saying, oh, the one called the Christ. And it's funny that Luke says, oh, she's the one called Magdalene. <laughs> she's it's this poss- big deal. Yeah. Uh. yeah. I mean, it's it's possible that the controversy around her even goes back to the first century and is reflected yeah. in Luke's gospel. But it's hard to know. It's hard to know so what we- the source of it is. Yeah, we know we know Peter and Paul didn't get along so great, but That's we also true. have Paul's writings, and so right. we have uh, a, more of an idea of what's going on there. Now we hear about other women who are in positions of of prominence, positions of leadership within early Christianity. Now, now I understand a lot of them are financially backing the church, providing mm-hmm. their homes mm-hmm. for meetings mm-hmm. and things like that. And people say, "Well, that's not really leadership. That's that's something who says something that." Different. <laughs> Well, I've, that's not very nice. <laughs> no, it's no, it's not. But um, we've heard some uh, some research in in recent years indicating there are inscriptions that date fourth, fifth, maybe even the sixth century that are still referring to women in, in um, positions of leadership within uh, Christian congregations. And then we have mm-hmm. Phoebe and Unia and and mm-hmm. others in mm-hmm. the New Testament. Was women leadership in early Christianity? as big or maybe even bigger a deal back then than it was today? Are they the complementarians that so many people Mm. seem to make them out to be? Or is it a third thing where whatever that relationship was like, it's unknown to us, we can't really reconstruct it? What are your thoughts on that? It's probably the latter. It it is unknown to us and we can't ever be certain. Um, There are, I, I would say that there was diversity of opinion at the very beginning. Um, you know, some would say that Jesus was quite egalitarian, although he does definitely seem to designate 12 men <laughs> for one role. But the question is whether women had a similar function. There's a there's an interesting uh, apocryphal book called The Sophia of Jesus Christ that just refers offhandedly to the 12 men and the seven women. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, wait, what? Um, so, so maybe there were the 12 men and the seven women. We only heard about the 12. That's the only mm-hmm. tradition that got passed on to us. Um, but Jesus did seem to make some sort of designation, like some difference between men and women, because there were the 12 men. Um, but at the same time, it does seem to be somewhat more, like certainly more acknowledging of women's possible well, and also even in the even in the Gospels, you get difference of opinion. I think, um, as I was saying, I think Luke presents women in a positive but very specific light. Mm-hmm. This is the right kind of woman to be. Yeah, yeah. Right. Whereas John actually, like with the Samaritan woman who goes and spreads the word to the Samaritans, and with Mary Magdalene going and sharing news of the resurrection with the apostles, it seems that John is open to women having more prominent leadership roles, even than the other Gospels. So there's sort of a diversity of opinion from gospel to gospel. And in the letters of Paul, of course, Galatians says there is no male or female, there is no slave or free, there is no Jew or Greek, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Whereas later letters of Paul and certainly the pastoral epistles make a really clear distinction between what women and what men can do. Mm -hmm. So some would say that there's, some have argued for sort of a, a narrative of decline where it starts out as more egalitarian and Jesus is focusing on like women and men having full humanity and full leadership equality. And then as time goes on in the context of the patriarchal Roman empire and like with certain misogynistic members of the church, women's roles eventually get effaced and erased and taken away. And, um, I do, I would say, believe in some sort of a decline narrative. It does seem to me that there was more possibility for women's leadership at the beginning that was erased eventually along the way. And that's part of what my work on John 11 is about. I'm saying it's possible that John presented Mary as a central character and that later copyists um, who found that role too threatening diminished her by importing Martha and 
splitting Mary Magdalene up into three different women that makes her less authoritative. This woman does yeah. this woman does this thing. This woman does this thing. This woman does this thing. As opposed Dilutes to one her woman, authority. correct? Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, I would argue uh, for that there is some sort of a decline narrative, um, and, and that, that seems kind yeah. of inevitable in what was a very patriarchal society at the time, as Christianity is spreading into the broader Greco-Roman world, there's a lot of patriarchy there. So it, it seems to me that diff- would be a difficult thing for them to, to fight against and maintain over the centuries. Yeah. And you can, I mean, you could even say, I don't know about like slavery, you know, same sort of thing with slavery. Like at first, maybe, you know, Maybe Jesus didn't want people to have slaves, but then as time goes on, like eventually they accommodate. You know, who knows? It's th- that's the kind of thing. As I said, it's impossible to be certain, yeah. but I think you can make a a reasonable case that there was, in a perhaps in Jesus's time, some more authority given to the women that does slowly get taken away over time and then eventually forgotten. And that's why we're so surprised when we find that there was a gospel of Mary. What? You know, like (laughs) no church father even mentioned that it existed until it was published in the 1950s. Scholars were completely unaware that there had Mm -hmm. ever been a gospel written in a woman's name. It was a shock. And it's not that there wasn't, there was, it's just that it was, you could say suppressed or forgotten or not acknowledged. And um, I think they've also found, you know, lots of mosaics with women in sort of leadership positions. And people are like, what is this? What is this depicting? (laughs) And it's like, okay, well, maybe there were women in leadership positions. And for whatever reason, through forgetting, through people disagreeing with it, it just eventually got forgotten or maybe suppressed over time. And I think, unfortunately, that makes it harder for people today who are retrojecting their conditioning regarding what Christianity looks like into the past to accept some of those uh, arguments, and particularly, for instance, well, I, <clears throat> your case for uh, Mary of Bethany being uh, Mary Magdalene, I imagine there is uh, some pushback among certain segments of, uh, of the scholarly community um, from folks yeah. who are a little more comfortable with uh, the church working in a way that uh, serves their interests. You know, it's interesting though, the textual critics are more open to it than you would have thought because you got, as I mentioned, it's happening throughout the entire textual transmission. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a real problem. And so like in the textual transmission that any text critic worth their salt will acknowledge, okay, there's something yeah. going on with Martha. Yeah. The question is why? Um, and I would say what's interesting, I get, emails from professors in surprising places, sometimes at Christian universities saying, mm. would you come talk to my class? Because oh, there's, and they, they privately say to me, this is causing a lot of people to think. I mean, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I've gotten invitations from Southern Methodist University, Pepperdine University, Wheaton, which Wheaton, Wheaton which is which is a Christian school. These yeah. are places that are considered tr- like traditional and conservative, and they're the ones who are most interested in this. So I would say there's not as much pushback as you would think. I think people Good. are interested in this possibility. Um, and the question is, the way the tr- the church turned out is that the way that Jesus wanted it, or is that the way that Peter wanted it? That's the real question that's being asked here. Yeah. And who, <laughs> so who, uh, whose uh, side are we advocating for today uh, when we look at and when we try to negotiate what the what the church is supposed to look like today? Exactly. exactly. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time. I've uh, enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I've a little bit left out to dry without my uh, without my co-host, uh, yeah, but hopefully I, I didn't do too. <laughs> we, we'll we'll make sure of that. But hopefully I didn't do too awfully. Oh, you did uh, great! You did a my... lot of stuff that I didn't know. That thing about Josephus <laughs> was great, and now I need to use that Spanish analogy. I'm going to use that all the time now. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm I'm glad I could help in some way. Uh, screw everything up if I can help in a couple of ways. Then then uh, I'm happy. So. Again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elizabeth schrader Polter, for your time. Congratulations it's my pleasure. on it's great on, to uh, connect with you. It's it's great to connect with you too. I look forward to more work from you and and uh, digging into more. Are you um, working towards publishing your dissertation? Yes, putting the book proposal together right now. Excellent, um, and that's a fun time. Yeah, and it's stressful can, but fun. <laughs> it is, yeah, and people can follow me and any updates for that on Twitter at Libby L I B B I E Schrader S C H R A D E R. 
And do you have any other social media presences beyond Twitter, or is that your uh, main outlet? It's, I get. I mean, I have Facebook, but that's just for friends. I mean, I have my website, elizabethschrader.com, and there's links to the peer-reviewed publications there if you want to read the Harvard Theological Review article or the Journal of Biblical Literature article. There's links to it there. And also to my upcoming presentations, like at SBL or local churches I present a lot. If people want to find out, that's that's where you can go. Excellent. All right, everybody, you know where to go. You can go uh, check out those papers. And um, I guess I will see you in San Antonio then. Yeah, see um, you then. Yeah, it's uh, not the the best venue for a lot of folks these days, but um, but I'm looking forward to it. It's a place to, to just see your friends. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that a great deal. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I hope uh, you've enjoyed this. I hope you've uh, learned something new and, uh, and hopefully been entertained to some degree at the same time. Check out uh, Dr. Schrader Poulter's song as well. Ah, uh, uh, yes. If you can find it. Uh, is it on it's YouTube? It's on elizabethschrader.com. And then on you click on Schrader. music. Click on the music tab. All right, click on the music tab. Uh, and as usual, if you would like to help us here at the Data Over Dogma podcast, continue to make the Data Over Dogma podcast. Uh, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash data over dogma. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, and since we did some Spanish earlier, cheese days or cheese maze, you can reach out to us at contact at data over dogma Hope y'all are having a wonderful week and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.